Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to the Penn uh, Public Neuroscience Lecture Series. This is our fifth lecture series event uh, that we've had so far, and we've had great turnout, so thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's hosted by the neuroscience graduate students. Um, my name's Kate. I'm one of the grad students. I'll be your host for the night. Um, and just a few questions. So how many people in the audience have been to one of our events before? Awesome, great. So glad to see everyone returning. Um, and how many people have, are new? Is this their first time? Fabulous, welcome. Uh, and one last question. How many people are not scientists? They don't do science as part of their day job. Great, you're all in the back. What's up with that? No. <laughs> No, come down to the front maybe for the next one. But no, this event is really for you guys, and we really encourage people that don't do science as their day job but are interested in it to come to these events, and this is really tailored for uh, you guys as an audience. So thank you for coming. So, and each time, and we encourage you to come back, each time we have these events, we have a different theme, uh, and so we encourage you, if you like the style of the events, to come back for our next theme. And this night, tonight's event, uh, the theme is the autistic brain and really understanding the neuroscience behind autism. So autism gets a lot of coverage in the media and it seems we are increasingly aware of the presence of autism in our society. Uh, autism coverage can range from optimism surrounding new treatments or controversial, such as the uh, claims that vaccines cause autism. This is what we know about autism today. Current data projects that about one in 68 children are now on the autism spectrum. And while this is not necessarily due to an increase in the prevalence of autism, we do know that there has been an increase in the diagnosis of autism in the past 10, 15 years. And interestingly, there seems to be a gender component. Boys are five times more likely to be diagnosed with autism. Additionally, there's an overwhelming economic burden on families with an autistic child, and this can be due to the loss of one parent's income when they quit their job uh, and have to stay home and care around the clock for their child, or also autistic children require special schooling, camps and activities, and specialized equipment. So, and these specialty services, if they're considered behavioral versus medical, will also not be covered under insurance. So this adds to the economic burden as well. And parents have to pay out of pocket for these treatments. And furthermore, when autistic children turn 22, their schooling and special support stops. So this is referred to as the autism cliff because they no longer have access to educational or vocational services that they need to transition into employment and adulthood. So these are all reasons to study autism and to recognize what we can do to help those individuals with autism. But how did we learn about autism and who first discovered the disorder? Uh, and in the history of autism, there are two important figures. So one is Dr. Leo Connor who was a child psychiatrist and physician at Johns Hopkins. And in 1943, he wrote a landmark medical paper that was the first to clinically describe features of children with autism. And in his study, he describes these children as highly intelligent, but displaying powerful desire for aloneness or for sameness. The second important figure is Hans Asperger, an Austrian physician who published studies of children with what came to be known as Asperger's syndrome which is now considered a part of the autism spectrum. And Asperger actually referred to the children he studied with autism as his little professors because of their ability to talk about their favorite subject in great detail. So since these first descriptions of autism by Drs. Connor and Asperger, much has been learned and expanded on what it means to have autism. So this is the latest medical standard defines autism by three major components, and these include deficits in social communication and interaction, as well as restricted patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Other common symptoms include problems with sleeping or mood disorders. As you see, there's a lot of overlap between other comorbidities. Additionally, in terms of other medical disorders, uh, people with autism have a prevalence of G GI or gastrointestinal disorders, as well as seizure disorders, which you'll actually hear more about later tonight. And these behavioral symptoms typically occur before the age of three, so during early childhood development. 
And importantly, autism is now considered a spectrum disorder. This means that autistic individuals vary widely in the severity and types of symptoms that they can have. So, so one thing we also know now is that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder. And tonight we want to introduce you some of the neuroscience research actually being done here at Penn uh, to study autism. And our three wonderful speakers tonight study the brain at very different scales and in very different ways. Uh, Dr. Mark Ficillo will be discussing work uh, with animal models of autism. Uh, Dr. Francis Jensen will focus on the overlap between epilepsy and autism. And Dr. Robert Schultz will discuss advances in early brain imaging during autism. And we hope you guys enjoy tonight's talks. Uh, after uh, each speaker, there'll be about five minutes for questions from the audience. We do ask that you wait for one of the two ladies uh, on the sides in the aisles to pass you a microphone before asking your question. Uh, and afterwards, we will have a catered reception out in the lobby. And our speakers have generously agreed to stick around during the reception. So if you have any further questions, feel free to come up to them then and ask them questions. Uh, and I just want to say that this event has really been great timing since April is Autism Awareness Month. And we also just had Brain Awareness Week uh, about two weeks ago in March. So this event really coincides with a lot of those, those two topics coming together. Uh, one thing we also want to ask when you go out to the, um, to the reception, that we have a reflection board up where you're able to post comments or thoughts or any other things that you've learned tonight. So feel free to keep thinking about those things as you go along for tonight's talks. Uh, and we also want to thank the Center for Autism Research uh, for having a booth here tonight, and also for Penn Autism, or Penn Speaks for Autism, I'm sorry. So thank you guys very much for coming out tonight. We appreciate that. <laughs> 